Hello and thank you for joining us on Journalist Hangout on Sunday. I'm Ayodili Uzubakun. Today on the program, media stakeholders speak on the need to overcome fake news in our weekend special. Kebi elders push for zoning of governorship and other positions in the states. And on the program, President of the Court of Appeals appealed to the federal government to increase judges' salary. Government College Ibadan all students lament over state of infrastructure in the school wants to be given mandates to fix it. And later on the show, fresh crisis brews at University of Lagos over reports of visitation panel. I'll be hanging out with Babaji de Koladeo Titoju and Adewali Adeoye. So if you're ready, let the hangout start now. To deepen the spirit of unity and togetherness among core members, several orientation activities are staged on camp for them. In furtherance of this, the National Youth Service Corps, NYC, in Lagos State organized a variety night for the 2021 Batch B Stream 2 core members at the orientation camp in Yanopaja, Lagos. It was all pomp at the event attended by an impressive crowd of core members, camp officials and other special guests of honor. Our own Babajide Koladeo Titoju was also there. Let's share some of the highlights of the night with you. It was indeed a night of pomp and circumstance as the National Youth Service Corps Lagos State Chapter held variety night for the 2021 Batch B Stream 2 core members at the orientation camp in Opada, Lagos. Attended by an impressive crowd of core members and camp officials, the event as a special guest of honor, TVC Communications Group Controller, Current of Public Affairs, Babajide Koladeo Titoju. In his remarks, Titoju urged the team and core members to aspire for political positions, noting that 70% of the nation's voting population are young people. Do not give up on our country. Do not lose hope in Nigeria. The reason some of us are chosen to stay here is because we are still optimistic that Nigeria will get better someday. We are still optimistic that someday Nigeria will begin to have a succession of good leaders. Then came the eagerly awaited moment. The reason for the gathering, representing each platoon, the contestants were decked in their NYSC white on white sports kit and new ceremonial outfits. They appeared perfectly poised as they majestically showcased their endowments. At the end of the keenly contested show of elegance and muscles, Oko Favor Kelechi was adjudged Miss NYSC, while Anneli Chigozie made it a clean sweep for Platoon 7 as it was decorated with the prestigious Mr. Matthew title. All right, Lagos State's uh, orientation camp. Ha, ah, Jide, I remember those days. <laughs> you told me uh, the clarion call. <laughs> so they, when they were singing the anthem, mm. uh, kind of rolled back the years yeah. only. You know, I remember how they used to chase us out of our hostess. Come around, you know. Ah. One of the core members was complaining to me that Mango they will come and wake us up. <laughs> Look, we are still here. It's, it's almost 12 and we are still here. And by 4 a.m. they will come and wake up. Honestly. I said, well, yes, that's the <laughs> you don't that's have to the, get used to that's it. That's the lifestyle. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to get used to it. It was fun. I told them the story of uh, General Seriki Mokta, who was, uh, mm. who was governor of uh, Kaduna State, and he came to our camp. And he spoke excellent English to the point that our guests surrounded him. They said he, he must not go. You know, his, the man, his voice is sweet and his language is impeccable. So they surrounded and said he, just, he must just continue to address them. You know, the way we normally do in school yes. now, when somebody can speak good English, we we'll <laughs> be uh, urging him on to, to keep speaking. So they just kept telling him, look, address us the more, address us the more. Because it was just fantastic on the day. You know, it was it was fun, and you will see that there are talents among these ones. 
a lot of them could sing to discover yes a lot of them could do um mc work this comedian they are very mm -hmm. funny mm -hmm. you know right and now, then, you are tapping into if mm -hmm. then when they started showing their muscles as a ah, I, I this, yeah. one, I this ones were students. Mm. Were they bouncers? <laughs> oh, my sis, so as a nigga kind of uh, Moses. Man, yes, that was fun. Uh, hey, was really fun. Those days, we just go to school, straight jacket, the teachers, um, the theoretical part of anything, not yeah. preparing us for that challenge ahead. I think NYC is trying to yeah. change that um, orientation it's, now. That's really really what is out there. Yeah. <laughs> is the, the talent the you can use. Your the skills best of, that matter. The best of life. Mm. Beyond the four corners of the South Korea that you know you've received from the normal university, so I think uh, it's quite impressive that the youth service is not just about you know match pass and all that, but about creative knowledge. So I think it's quite impressive. You know? mm. Mm. And these people in the next twenty years, most of them they just you know, their directors, their yeah. general, they are yes. they're in different mm. places. That's the and beauty the of it. Thing, I like the fact that uh, the NYC is trying to create. I mean, they created a fund for mm -hmm. SMEs. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, so some of them will want to take up, uh, yes, little, yes, yes, yes. start little companies of their own. Everybody that will so do a big yeah. There is a fund. There is there is a there is a financial um, pool that you pool can access. That you can access so that you can become something great hmm. in your life. I also remember that when I got there. You know, I said it, uh, that you can't get into that place mm, without a COVID-19 mm. test. Mm. They subjected me to the test. The mm. girl first apologized. She asked me, have oh, you done this test? He said, have you done this test before? I said, no. He said, <laughs> just calm down. And then they drilled that thing into my nose. And then I did this. She, she, she said, uh, don't be annoyed. Sir. How many minutes? And they were within like uh, 10 minutes was over. Yeah, and so. the people who did the test were also core members. Mm. Mm. Working with uh, the yeah, SCDC, yeah. SCDC yeah. people, you know, so it was fun. You can't get it. There are three layers of security, and they, it is impregnable. You mm. cannot get into the NYC camp in Lagos mm. without re doing a COVID test. Mm. I went through it. The pictures are there. So I challenge anyone who says, oh, they are not taking care of the, the core members, this and that. There is a, um, a deluge of cases of COVID in camp, they should try and see whether they can get inside. Whether they, they say, uh, uh, soldiers, you have civil defense, there are three layers of security mm -hmm. that you the, cannot get past. Yes. Hmm. Nice one. Nice one. Now, moving on now, the menace of fake news continues to elicit public discourse with the risk of causing problems in the society, if not checked. In this in this weekend special of journalists and hangouts, analysts advocate enforcement of laws to punish purveyors of fake news. Let's share the story from Adeyemika Adeni with you. Lately, fake news has been a topic on our lips. And with the rise of social media and its power of virality, the task has been to decipher what is true and what isn't. I don't like the term fake news. I want to agree with the position taken by a, a professor in the United States of America saying that the media ought not to promote this because if it is fake, it is not news. News is the representation of reality of what really happened in the society. So once you have fake, he said we should rather use um, the term viral deception because there's an attempt on the source of that information to deceive and mislead people. So um, what we call fake news in media terms should be misinformation, misleading information, distortion and oxys promoted by someone that has an agenda of misleading the public or confusing the public in order to achieve either a political, economic or social or social goal or to cause about disaffection in the society. Fake news has been around for so long. It has, in fact, been around for as long as the media has been around. What has led to a lot of um, journalists, partisan journalists, scholars, and the rest of media watchers to come up with the terminology of fake news is, is the promotion of outright falsehood. Do we have that challenges with the media in history? Yes, of course, because that's what we used to call yellow journalism in, 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 the, print, in the print medium, where um, you make an attempt to, to sensationalize issue. You, you, you turn everything into a, 
a tabloid in order to win, to gain the attention of readers and win readers. Away from the media, some feel the government's desperation and lack of proper education are causes of the continued spread of false information. The issue of uh, fake news has become so prevalent as said, but this traceable to the disposition of the government itself towards information dissemination. If we are in a season where our government has turned its own information apparatus, information machinery to a platform for propaganda and for dissemination of the untruth, misleading people, misguiding the populace. So that is invariably encouraging people that if government is marketing lies, if government is marketing on truth, so what moral pedestal do you have to question people who just wake up and spread fake news all over? A fake news is as a result of the fact that the space is being dominated by a lot of semi-literate and desperate people, and that is why they engage themselves in fake news, spreading rumor. And fake news is dangerous to the existence of any society. Education is the only solution to curtailing the effect of fake news. If you have a society that is enlightened, they might not likely embrace fake news. So we need to strengthen our curriculum, and we need to make primary and secondary education compulsory in this country. In a country as populated as Nigeria, religious and ethnic differences can be sources of conflict, with facts not seen as sacrosanct. The truth gets blurred and misinformation gets peddled. There is a concept in dealing with misleading information, in dealing with hoaxes, in dealing with false information, is the concept of um, pillarization. We create pillars in the society. Um, that's by playing identity politics. For example, if you go to the Americans, there's African-American. We look at people based on the color of their race, on their gender, and the rest of it. And in the process, um, we, we, narrow, we give a narrow perspective to issue. Now, you talk about Fulani men. Are all men in Nigeria Fulani? Have you ever heard the term of Ijo fishermen? Have you ever heard of the term Igbo traders? The media should not join the political class in creating pillars. Over time, people tend to accept that as a reality. And when we accept that as a reality, it creates division within society and it creates misconception among, among the citizenry. The effects of fake news are not mild, with a risk of causing major problems in any society it's very, very serious. That's why we're sitting on something very dangerous, something that can, I mean, set the world on fire. We're, we're dealing with a phenomenon of mis both misinformation and disinformation. Misinformation it could mean it's not quite deliberate, but disinformation means some people are deliberately putting out their materials, injurious. The intent is to manipulate the minds of the people for objectives known to them for their own interest. That's absolutely inimical to national development. It's injurious. Now we've gotten to the point where people can't even differentiate between what is real and original anymore. And that is made more difficult by the democratization of the, democ of the media space. Now everyone is a, is a mini TV station. Every person is a mini uh, newspaper man. People can sit in the corners of their homes and cook up whatever it is and put it out there. And when even the original comes, people even begin to now dispute the original. And most of the time, the kind of news that we're talking about are such that uh, they really put out there to promote hate, to promote bigotry, to manipulate the minds of the people for deliberate purposes of causing division. When you talk about what that can do, then you think back to countries who have um, been victims of, who have some bad experience with genocide. For instance, Rwanda, you look at the role that the media play in 
Rwanda, for instance, on the road, media pleading, Kenya. Even Nigeria, way back, you think to the, the Second Republic and the, the politics, and the role the media play, broadcasting was used to manipulate the mind of the people. So, and that is why, ordinarily, the media is not something that it ought to be in the hands of anybody. That's why media has proper uh, filtering process before an item can make it to the top or make it out. You have to go through a process where people will vet to ensure that this is really true. Because once it's out there, the damage might have been done and it's not easy to make comments thereafter. Thankfully, there are laws that can punish persons guilty of spreading fake news. There are laws that regulate or affect fake news. There is um, the laws of sedition, the laws of um, defamation, uh, the various uh, broadcast laws, and um, of course, individual peer um, content management uh, rules from different organizations and bodies. For instance, the Nigerian Institute of Journalists or the Nigerian Union of Journalists, I beg your pardon, you know, have mechanisms for sanctioning members who have gone or have infracted the rules of traditional journalism, right? So naturally, uh, when a journalist has gone foul or run foul of any of the rules and has put fake news out there, there is a peer disciplinary mechanism for addressing those kind of things. They can either suspend him or withdraw his credentials and, you know, that will address the matter. But how do we define what is fake and what is not? Is there room for abuse in determining this? I sincerely am not a particular, particularly great fan of those laws of sedition. I think they, they, they are too easy to abuse. You know, they are too easy to abuse to restrict and reduce the, the freedom of individuals. We've seen it happen in Kaduna State, it, certain individuals. We've seen it happen in Kano State. We've seen it happen in the crossover state with Agba Jaligo. You know, so those laws are easy to exploit to restrict the rights of citizens to express themselves. And in cases, especially in cases where they are expressing matters of truth. So, but in, in any case, when there is an infraction of those laws, government should not insist. The law is the law. Once the law exists, no matter how um, palatable that law is, it is the law. So once those laws exist, and people, people are found to have infracted them, I think the punishment should be swift. Our judges should be trained also in raising the quantum of compensation they give people who establish that they have been defamed. Because defamation is, um, is a serious matter. So you can't just come and find that someone has defamed you, you have been defamed, and then you are worth 30000 or 100000 How far would that go in addressing the person's um, um, to the person's, the damage to the person's character and reputation. The conclusion here is that fake news is damaging and an end must be brought to it. Ayoyimi Kadini, TVC News, Lagos. Well, you know, in the newsroom every day all the time, we we, we, we contend with fake news. There are many of fake news all around. You see information even from, uh, you're meant to check uh, your source. You discover that even from credible sources at times, you still yes. encounter <laughs> yes, the people that news. you should you, you know. trusted over the years. Yes, mm. people that will give you. They mislead you. Yes, but you, still. You will look stupid at the end of the day. You know, credible media, big newspapers, big media outlets, you still discover that they still fall into this trap of fake news. It's, it's um, only eternal vigilance can help us um, get over this problem. It's a very, very big problem. And the advent of social media, yeah, as much as we want to say we are grateful that the internet came in our time <laughs> because it has made any job that you are doing the internet has made it a lot easier yeah, it is described time. as the 
the greatest invention since light. So the internet also gave us social media. But social media has come with all kinds of problems. All kinds of problems. Social media has turned every individual to a journalist. Emergency journalist. Without training. Overnight. Without the capacity to filter. Everyone just thinks bloggers. that it's a journalist. They call themselves bloggers. bloggers. All kinds just of people. Copy and paste. Just nonsense. put all kinds of things. Ethics, on, everything, on, on, not there. Nothing. No, nobody regulates. No. There's no regulation in the real sense. So people just want hits, hits, hits. And whatever they can do to attract it, mm. whether it is by uh, putting out fake news or one-sided reports, they are ready to do it. When remember when the uh, president of Chad died, they claimed that uh, his son had killed all his bodyguards and the, his uh, and his ADC. That the son believed that uh, his father was murdered. We were trying to, because when I heard that story, I called the ambassador, the Chadian ambassador to Nigeria. And he told me that these things were not true. Do you know that even my own friends on, on social media, they were saying, look, what did you expect him to tell you? <laughs> and, and these guys were lying. Does Later on, they brought out a picture of somebody being buried. Yes, and they claimed that it was, uh, narrative. it was uh, the president of, uh, uh, the, uh, it was Debbie that was being buried. Meanwhile, Debbie's barrier had been scheduled for Friday so that international leaders can attend. You, you know? So it's, it's, it's terrible. It's terrible. It's Jordan, how are you combating this menace of fake news? Well, I, I think it's a major threat to journalism and uh, mass communication. Um, it's not just about media practitioners. We have uh, political actors who are dedicated to the spread of fake news, especially when it's coming to election seasons. Mm. We have a... Uh, just to... Yeah. We have uh, trade competitors, mm. you know. Just to malign the opponents. Who are fighting each other. They mm. issue out all sort of uh, false information about their competitors in order to rubbish them. Mm. So mm. The, the main actors, it's not just uh, media practitioners. And of course, even when you are talking about people in the media, there are all sorts of people that just come up parading themselves as journalists. They just set up blogs, you know, and begin to spread all sort of information. And then, um, you know, th they do it for so many reasons. Sometimes for economic reasons, because people want to draw huge uh, population into their website. And so they just pass on a lot of wrong information so that you can be compared to go and, you know, kick the, you know, click on the, on the, on the website. But I think we have to realize that um, digital media, the advent of digital media has made it to be more pronounced. It's not as if it's, it's a new phenomenon. But now with digital media, it has become um, a major problem. Now, the problem we're having is it's really going to reduce the impact of uh, real stories. It's going to also undermine the integrity of uh, legitimate news stories. Because when you will repeat uh, false information over and over and over again, people are more likely to accept uh, such information as true. Especially when you're in a situation where the a site where the capacity of people to analyze mm. the level of education is very low. Mm. You know, mm. you see all sorts of headlines that even does not even reflect the content of the story. Mm -hmm. You know, we have read, you know, somebody who claimed to be a journalist, you know, who was telling Nigerians that he attended the burial of a of a Nigerian president mm. in Saudi Arabia. Mm. And he was interviewed people quoting and people believed him. You know, mm. so all sort of lies, all that sort of propaganda. That was one that said that. I saw Ajibola met you know who was dead. Yes, yeah. yes. That many people were calling. That quotes me. Oh, yes, yeah. the person was saying quotes me. You can't sit in the anywhere in the world. So it's uh, <laughs> like silly people. Yeah, it's, you know, people should have conscience. People should have some level of dignity. You can't just begin to dish out lies over time. You know, but people should also know that when a website is associated consistently with false information, mm. the people mm. have the right to impose their own uh, sanction on mm. that kind of. So okay. you just make sure you ignore that kind of website. There are some websites mm. I don't visit again. Yeah. I don't, mm. no. I don't bother to visit to get any information. All right. I have a postdoctoral fellow at the Dabua, who is also a lecturer at the Lagos State University, Lasso, Dr. Ghani Atijani Adenle, joins us via Zoom. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> All right. The menace of fake news. How will you consider it as um, injurious to our society? 
Oh, um, it's a terrible thing for me. It's like you know, it's like an atomic bomb. It's not. Its effect is not limited to whatever it causes in that at that instant. It's something that keeps affecting the society on for years to come. I I um I'm a postdoctoral fellow with the Bauer, and what the Bauer does, like um, some other fact checking organizations, is that it fact checks um fake news or information disorder online and uh, on the media space. And I see that you know the wind you know, something will be shared online, it will be fact checked, and then a year later the, the information is trending all over again and people are believing it. And it's not just about politics, it's not just about elections or you know, sometimes it's even about health. You see people who, who you know take um, believe misinformation online and they die or they lose their loved ones because they believe you know what they read or what they were told and so for me it's, it's a, I, I think we, we should like guard our media space the way we guard our nation because information disorder can kill from being it can destroy everybody without you seeing the enemy that that's destroying you and what what i find more appalling and sad about is the fact that even media organizations that are repeated, but I've been listening to your discussion and I have to agree absolutely that you know, uh, social media has given us people who are claiming to be citizen journalists are uh, all social media influencers who just go out there and spill racial, religious, ethnic, you know, malinformation and cause chaos. But what is more than that mean are media organizations, credible, reputable media organizations you know, falling into information disorder, whether they are sharing new information or whether it's malinformation, they are actually taking part, but they are weaving it in the wrong way to cause chaos. Let me just say something very recent. I'm sure everybody is all about the um, uh, PIB bill and how oh, 3% is so small for derivative communities and all of that. I read uh, Mr. Kola, uh, Mr. Simon Kalawale's article, but my question is how many Nigerians are going to sit down? to read such articles that will explain, you know, the, the nuances and why journalists, trained journalists, you know, are wrong to be, um, you know, misinterpreting and weaving, you know, falsehood around facts. So I feel the problem we have, perhaps it would have been easier if information disorder is not even happening in reputable media organizations. So we can okay. tell people, you know what, you get your news from here. But now we can't even say that. So it's everywhere. And that is why um, fact checking, like what Baba is doing, improving media literacy is very key because you have to be on guard. It's really no, it's no longer about this is credible. Every, you can, every medium can actually. All right, let me, let me just hold you on there. Dr. Ghani Atijani, let me just hold you on. Also, I have. Um, Mr. Simon Kolawale, the CEO and founder of the Cable News, with us, joining us. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you very much for having me on the program. Yes, I, I know. <laughs> the Cable has been at the vanguard yes. of, you know, checkmating the fake news. Anytime, if there's a presidential debate, if somebody is even saying something out of error, all through the 2019 election, I was enjoying your fact check and everything. So, Thank I want us... I want you to give an insight how you've been tackling the menace of fake news yeah thank you very much um the first point i would like to make is that fake news is a threat to everyone it's a threat to you it's a threat to me it's a threat to societal order uh it's a threat to the journalism profession uh all, all those who have spoken before me now have pointed out the fact that this thing has crept it was even what we call professional journalism. Uh, before, I was not worried because of Facebook, Twitter. Not that I was not worried, but I felt, oh, if people wanted to cross-check uh, the facts or whatever uh, as they presented to them, then they would go to reputable newspapers, they would go to professional outlets. But this thing has crept in now because a lot of what we now call conventional papers, professional papers and TV stations, they are now taking the cue. From social media they will mm, see yes. some information on social yes, media yes. and they will difficult. grab immediately and rebroadcast without even uh, uh verifying which is a tragedy it is 
Now, what have we been trying to do at the cable? Anytime we see a piece of information that we are unable to confirm, we have a fact, je uh, de uh, a fact check desk. So we pass it on to them and say, please cross check this information, especially if it has been published. Now, this is where some people have problems. Those who are professional journalists can easily, like Mr. Otitoju said, he calls the Chadian ambassador to Nigeria. Is this thing mm. true? But what I have found out is that many of the people who are pretending to be journalists, they do not have more than a mobile phone, and then they bought uh, data. That is all they have in their lives. They cannot call anybody to confirm if what they have seen is true or not. So all they just do is to push it out. Now, I still want to make a distinction, which is very critical. There is a difference between a mistake and what I call mischief. The, a, a professional newspaper, a properly established newspaper, can make a mistake and say this has happened when it actually didn't happen. Now, what a professional newspaper does is to now do correction, retraction. Uh, New York Times is one of the most respected newspapers in the world. They have a column dedicated to corrections and clarifications every day so that they can set the record straight. Now, that is the professional way of going about it. So we have to segregate that from those who actually go out deliberately. It is intentional. There is a motive when they push out this information. There are also people who just created something out of a joke. By the time they post it, people will now start broadcasting and resharing mm. without a caveat that, oh, this is just a joke that we are creating. Um, I mean, when uh, Chief Femi Panika, they crossed over to APC, mm. somebody quickly did a design and said, Yaya Bello, uh, Panika, they ticket, and started sharing. Now, I can bet the person was just <laughs> having fun. But now, those who would not bother yes, to cross check, those who would not bother, bother to verify, we just go out and say, oh, you see, the, these are the people that APC wants to feed. So, those are the kind of things that lead us into cross checking the fact because all of the information, we just know that, no, this is not possible. Simon, Simon let, me ask, let me ask you quickly. Yes. What can we do? What can we do? Because we simply can't go on like this. What can we do? Uh, are, are our laws sufficient to address this uh, this this big problem? Well, I would say there is good news and there is bad news. Uh, the good news, if it is called good news at all, is that it's a global problem. It's not limited to Nigeria. Now, why it is good news is that even confronting it now, we can have a common front in fighting the scourge of fake news worldwide. Um, in Nigeria, actually, there are laws that already take care of these things. But we always think we need new laws. That is the way we are wired in Nigeria. There is a Telecoms Act that deals with the abuse of telecom pla platforms to, for mischief or whatever. It's there. And of course, there are also laws of libel and defamation. We have them. So the problem now is the enforcement. But we're also in a political environment where there is suspicion, you know, the government is trying to censor, oh no, the people are trying to pull down the government. So it makes it difficult to even know the, the way forward. That is why, if you are talking about the legal aspect. But the, the, the aspect that I have been trying to promote in my own corner is fox check. So anything anybody sends to you, please, don't broadcast, don't share until you have cross-checked. You, you cannot put something in a group that has 200 people and say, please, is this thing true? You are either telling people to reshare, you are just being hypocritical. Why don't you pick somebody there that you trust? I, and in some WhatsApp groups, when some information is being shared, somebody will just send to me directly and say, please, cross-check this thing before I post in the group. You can see somebody is sincerely trying to, uh, to verify. But you don't have that. So apart from the legal aspect, which I think should be enforced, because there are laws taking care of these things, even though it will come with its own complications, or maybe there is an attempt to censor, but also the media itself should work towards 
verification because what is lacking is verification. Okay. So we should take it upon doctor. ourselves to verify. Let me go to Dr. Gani at uh, Tijani. Now, um, as a journalism teacher, what are those things that can be done at your level to combat fake news? Okay, um, I, I think well, one of such initiatives is what we just um, set up in Lasso after a Dubawa fact check training, and that is um, having a fact check club for students. You see, a lot of people who post things online are actually youths. And so if we can create a culture where young people are you know, responsible and they are critical of the information they get and they share on social media, we are going to be solving a large chunk of the problem. Another thing I think we can also do is that we can promote organizations like Dubawa, where you're, you're seeing something flying online, you're not sure. If you go to dubawa.org, there's a likelihood that somebody has checked it and you can get the information. So one thing people do is that they share fake news or misinformation, but when they see the, you know, the fact check, they rarely share it. So if you share a misinformation and you get a fact check done by Dubawa and then you should, you should reshare it so that other people can you know, know about it. I think we also need to promote media literacy. People need to know how media works. Um, I know, I think after Sunday, Bowo's house was, you know, bombarded and all of that. Somebody created a fake Facebook um, page um, picture to show that the ammunition were actually recovered in 2013. I mean, everybody who saw that thing believed it. But if you are media literate, you will know that there are technologies, there are applications that can create fake Twitter uh, posts and fake um, Facebook posts, you know. So what we're trying to say is that if you are media literate, you would not, we can't go back to the old era of the almighty media effect theory where you believe everything you see on social media or everything you hear. So, you know, be media literate because before you see the person to court and all of that, the other could have been done. So we need to, you know, promote fact checking and every media organization needs to have a fact check deck like the cable does and like the Bauer has also helped many media organizations to, you know, to set up so that they can also verify facts. I mean, even if you correct, some people have gotten the information and they'll still keep going about it with it. I took a Mara some days ago because I wasn't going far. And someone was still saying in the Mara that uh, Buhari is from Sudan, you know, the real Buhari is dead. This is 2021. You can just imagine some things don't get, some people's minds will not change, regardless of the, the, you know, the correct information that they have once they've been exposed to misinformation. So that is also very critical. I think we need well, to focus more on... Taking it from your love. perspective here, mm -hmm. and when you look at it, that, oh, the people that we should be looking up to, sometimes, even mm -hmm. sometimes from the federal government, mm -hmm information that maybe there are information handlers mm. they will still come out at the end of the day to say this is not coming from us yeah. okay let's say we, we got something from a media person from the federal government and the minister coming up to say no this is not from us so, so how do we now receive this information you see the media has its own obligation its own obligation to the people and that is to inform correctly irrespective of the source of that information. Whether this information is coming from the president or from the governor, the media should <coughs> do investigation. Yes. These days, people just write press statement and send to journalists. Mm. In, in our own time, and this is still our own time, you, when you get an information, you do background check because the person giving you that information is not perfect. Yes. They can commit error. Mm. It may also have a different motive. Mm -hmm. Which might be, you know, to score political gains. In spite of the fact so that it's representing yeah, the government. You don't just go out and, you know, keep reporting press statements. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to thoroughly subject every information into the, into the, into the you know, into, into the three-way test. Mm -hmm. Whether it is true, whether it is factual, whether mm -hmm. it's, it is real. So we media people, we need a lot of work to do, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of, you know, dissecting information that, you know, are given to us by government officials. In terms of uh, uh, private uh, individuals. The overnight uh, Chankara journalists yeah. that yeah. we have all around, it's uh, you not know, making things easy. You know, you know, what baffles me was what um, Simon said earlier on. I think we touched on it a little bit, whereby even journalists are taking their cue from social media. Mm. It's, it's extremely disgraceful that a person who had journalism training, 
Mm. Some of them went to journalism school. Yeah. Mm. You do not know that social media, the, the, a lot of the people there have no interest in any form of filtration. Mm. Whatever comes, they just slam this. Yeah. And you too will not One try. One sided, not balanced. Yes, you will not try your best to even check. Mm. Do you know? Because a lot of so called gatekeepers in media houses are extremely lazy. Mm. They see something on, on social media, they are not willing to add their own fresh line to yeah. it. Mm. If you Copy are committed to feast. adding your own fresh line, mm. in yeah. the process of adding your own fresh line, you mm. ask one or two questions. Yeah. And then you will even discover that it's actually false. Now, we have a situation in which, in some states, some media houses have correspondence. Mm. A fake news will emanate from that state. You are not going to even ask your own correspondent yeah, you to go to the scene. Mm -hmm. You won't so ask your correspondent to go check. to the scene. You, you are rushing to go and slam <laughs> what you saw on social Breaking media news, yes. because you want to break news. Does it not make sense to not break news than to break fake news mm -hmm. and lose your credibility? Oh, we too, as media people, we need to do some soul searching. Yeah. Yeah. We need to ask ourselves pertinent questions. Yeah. Yeah. So yes. On, on because, because you too, the media house saw it uh, on social media mm. and thought it was sensible to simply put it on air. We should go beyond all that. We need to be more hardworking. We need to be more focused. Mm. We need to take our time to dissect between yeah. fake news and what consists real news. Otherwise, this thing will get worse and the social media will help us to finally destroy the mainstream media mm. because we are mm. heading towards that mm. direction now mm. they are now like the agenda setters mm. people that we know them they are obvious of they falsehood are, they, they are ignorant they, they are now looking are like they are looking like the the the, the, the trailblazers mm. now mm. but we must ask ourselves is this right mm. and we must be committed to doing what is right at all times mm. mr kawale mr kawale on the final analysis, when we 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 are moving towards another uh, electionary period, 2023, and as a person, I expect <laughs> more of this unsubstantiated news just flying around and everything. How can we tackle this? Yes, um, there is no doubt that we are going to we are enter a season of more fake news and fake news and fake news. There is no doubt about that. Actually, at the cable, we are setting up a special uh, desk to just fact-check issues around uh, the 2023 elections, uh, which we are, we are starting very early. Now, it's the same solutions we have to uh, apply. One, let every credible newspaper have a fact-check uh, desk, as Dr. Ghanayat has said. Every newspaper, every TV house, every credible media, media, media organization must have a fact check desk. Because the truth is that we cannot control what goes into social media. It is beyond us. But we can help those who want to learn. We can help those who want to verify by making sure that we lead them aright. People must know that whatever they see on Facebook, they should take it with a pinch of salt. They should now check, is this on a credible platform? It is very, very important. It is not everything that they get wrong on social media. Sometimes they get it right. But this can only be to kind of nudge you as a professional media uh, organization to cross-check they have said so 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 person is dead, or they have said they have found so 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 ballot boxes in somebody's house. You can now go and find out. Don't just say because it is on one website or on one Twitter handle, you want to run and rush, uh, use it. So it is very important. The media will play, play that, the professional media. I don't believe in this thing they call citizen journalism. Is, 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 I mean, it's, it's a fraud. There are a lot of things that go to. Mr. Um, Simon Kolaoli, I want to thank you for your contribution. I don't know, Dr. Ghani at Tijani, your final take? She's still there. Um, 
The DRP crew who works for people in government should also put out information on time. So if you put out information on time, then um, mischievous people would not be able to, you know, play on people's um, urge to know what is happening to create this information. So I feel the fact that sometimes uh, the, those representing our leaders do not relate well with the media, they also give mischief makers the opportunity to create fake news. And I also think that the reality is we cannot divorce uh, the economics of media organizations from this issue of information disorder. A lot of media organizations are not doing well financially. We have to be realistic. And a lot of people, you know, some are not being paid salaries or some are left and they've gone to create their own websites. And you don't see the quality with which they were working in a mainstream organization in what they are doing, you know, online now. So I think a lot of these things, apart from you know, a poor appreciation of the effect of information is that some of them and a good number of them is still related to the economics of, you know, feed rates and getting as much into their website Dr. as possible. Ghania Tijani Adele. Thank you, thank you. A postdoctoral fellow at the Dubawa and it's also a lecturer at Lagos State University, Lasso Ojo. And I want to thank you. Um, Mr. Simon Kolaoli, I think today, Simon Kolaoli, later today I will read your page on yeah. this, this day. I don't miss it <laughs> every Sunday. Thank you so much for your contribution. Thank you, Simon. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Uneasy calm is enveloping the political atmosphere in Kebi State, Northwest Nigeria, over vex issue of zoning political offices, the Kebi State Elders Forum want the governorship seats and other positions to be rotated among the three senatorial districts and emirates councils in the states. The forum wants the governorship position to be zoned to Kirby North, which has not produced the governor except the deputy. Wow. We are, still we are going to be faced with a lot of this yeah. ahead of 2023. Yeah. And <laughs> for so many states. Parties. Yes. Yes. We are going to be faced with this. Yes, although zoning is not in our constitution, mm -hmm. but then a lot, of people, the a lot of people feel that look for things to be right yeah. for, for us for the cohesion mm -hmm. and for fairness is like other happen. I see people who keep reminding us that oh, it's not in the constitution. I see them as politically selfish people. There is no time that we have not used zoning. We've always used zoning. At some point, we use zoning mm. because that is the only way to allow for fairness to reign within mm. political parties in the recruitment of leaders. You know, during the Second Republic, they used it. Political parties at their level, they are best placed to come up with a zoning formula to say, okay, this time around, we have the chairman of the, uh, the national chairman of the party. Therefore, we should let the uh, president come from another zone. Because if you allow the same zone, for example, to produce both, then people will wonder, is, this, uh, is there a sense of inclusiveness in this party? And it can even lead, cause people to leave for another party. So in Kirby State, since 1999, Guandu Emirate alone has been producing the governor of the state. Mm. There are four emirates. We have the Guandu Emirate, which is bringing Kebi, the state capital, mm. and, uh, and uh, also known as Kebi Central. The Arugungu Emirate, mm. which is Kebi North. We have the Yauri Emirate, as well as Zuru Emirate. Now, the Yauri, uh, the uh, Arugungu is Kebi North, while the Yauri and Zuru Emirates share North. the same uh, senatorial zone. Remember Zuru, they produced more than 50 generals and at least 30 professors. Mm. They are well educated, everyone knows them for producing gallant mm. officers. Mm. And, uh, and men in the army. Remember the uh, Bamayi brothers yeah, yeah. Uh, from Zuru? Mm. Mm. Um, um, Tanko, Abdul, uh, Tanko um, Ayuba, mm. 
who was a minister mm -hmm. uh, during the uh, Bangladesh regime, mm -hmm. and uh, so many others, including the gallant Nigerian commander who lost his life in Metele mm -hmm. during one of the bloodiest attacks carried out by Boko Haram on Nigerian troops. Mm -hmm. That is uh, Colonel Ibrahim Sakaba. Mm -hmm. It's also mm -hmm. from uh, from Zulu. So, mm -hmm. but they've not produced the governor. That's that's the gifted to the mm, yes, so. as brilliant mm. as gifted as they are, it has never gone there since 1999. It's been the same, uh, KB Central, and even right now, the Attorney General of the Federation, uh, Malami, Malam, Malam. and the governor, the current governor of the state, they are from the same word, yes, they are from the same Nasarawa, look, look, look the, at same word. the same word, yes, Nasarawa one. And two, th their polling stations is, w uh, is what is different. They vote in d different polling stations under Nasarawa. So one is in Nasarawa one, the other one is Nasarawa two. So I'm saying that even in terms so of where balance. they vote, yes, in terms of where they vote, they are almost in the same even polling the governor polling and the stations are coming up from the same. Yes, place. and now yes. now one of the front runners. We are talking about governorship election in Kebbi now. Mm. The first name that comes to anyone's um, um, mouth is the Attorney General of the Federation, mm. although he has not publicly announced it. But if that were to be the After case, that means eight years, uh, eight years. Spending eight years. from his own words, same words from his own words, person will now replace you. Yes, from his own word of, of Nasarawa, another person may probably replace him. And I think that is why these um, these leaders are coming out to say no. Mm. This has to change, mm. you know, that mm. the, for, for the purpose of inclusion, let's have this thing rotate to other uh, senatorial zones and other emirates within the state. I think there's something like that. It has always been like that within the states that, look, you should live here to go to, the, at least I know of Agungu because mm. of the fish mm. first, yeah. <laughs> yeah. that uh, international festival. Mm. And uh, now, and this thing is just for fairness, yeah. for a sense of mm. belonging, all true. I think the argument is that if you want to have a leader, the primary consideration should be about the quality of that leader, the level of integrity, whether he can deliver mm. to the people. That is on paper, mm. which is a very good thing. If you want to pick the president or governor of the country, I mean, you look at the best person, irrespective of where the person comes from. Mm. But then, uh, Kebi was created in 1991, I think. They had a governor for two, you know, doing NRC, um, uh, PDP. Mm. And from that time, 1999 to now. 30 years ago. Uh, uh, it's the same senatorial district. And the slogan of that state is land of equity. Mm. So where is the equity? <laughs> so for me, and you know, Kebi is a plural society. You have the mm. Kambiri, you have uh, mm. Dakwa, you have uh, Fulani, you have Hausa and all that. So, if you now restrict the gov uh, governative seat to only one senatorial district, Kebi uh, uh, Central, living south and north, I think it's just not, um, it's, 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 it's unfortunate. The Zulu that he mentioned, the very age-long um, nationality with tested history, they are warriors naturally. Yes. And uh, they are well known all over the world, you know, based on their history and all that. So I think it's just, um, we have to realize that politics is about inclusion. It's about justice. Those that are saying that, uh, you know, we don't need to rotate, it's mm. about self-interest. So they are the beneficiaries. Anybody who soon yes. has not produced the, the governor. The former governor of Nasarawa yeah, State was saying that, that it doesn't uh, matter. Yeah. Because they are beneficiaries. It's, it's they are been politically system. selfish. <laughs> so I think mm. it could lead to a lot of consequences where mm. people feel continuously marginalized. And can be people even when they were... I mean, the Zulu people, when they were in Sokoto State, mm. the same marginalization they have you suffered are for years. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now that we have can be say we thought that they will have some level of a constitution. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it's just fairness. That okay, we, we, to we have the public relations officer of the movement for the rotation of political parties in Kebi State, Abdullahi Mohammed Lamba, via Zoom, for more insights on this. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Yes, we want you to tell us what is this agitation for rotation all about in Kebi State. Yeah. Thank you very 
Oh yeah, uh, I think we'll try and reconnect him mm. with through. Oh, oh phone. we just talked to him uh, by phone. Phone on phone, we'll do yeah, it. Phone. That way. Because um, some people will even say that look, even the federal government, mm. at different times they've breached this. They we have what you call we have a federal character. Federal character. Mm. Recently, the House of Representatives actually uh, took a swipe at uh, President um, Buhari for that the secretary, the chairman and the secretary of this federal character commission right mm. now, mm. they are not us. So if the federal character commission, no, even in the federal character, federal character commission, there are some nasty things going on. There. Ah, mm. if you know, nasty is, things going on. This agency is meant to be that the, that needs to be addressed. If we want to say that we don't want federal character commission anymore, fine. We know that we don't have it anymore. But if we have it, then the stipulations must be obeyed. Must be respected. All there is a reason why federal character principle was created in the first place. It's because you are looking at a polarized nation like Nigeria. Mm. In Nigeria, a country that is diversity has to be mm. well handled. So a situation in which we do not uh, have, uh, 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 we have federal character and then we are not handling our diversity the right way, mm. Does not all go well for That's us. What, that diversity. We must, we must handle that diversity. Yeah. When we handle it well, it becomes a strength. Mm. Mm. You understand? And everyone will feel that they belong. But that is not the case. Because we are far more, more divided. Far more divided now than at any time oh, in our history. I've Every little thing people want to, to read to reach, ethnic mm, ethnic into and it. religious ministries. Look at this VAT matter. Yeah. But that if we, if uh, the thing were to be followed, states like Kano they will benefit tremendously. Yeah. That's the center of commerce. Even Bono will benefit. Hmm. Center of commerce. Do you know how many hours trailers spend just loading fish in Baga? 24 hours they are loading fish. Hmm. There's no part of Nigeria blessed with fish like Baga. No, no, no. Yes. Hmm. Overnight they are working. They are working loading fish. Many trailers, they come all the way from Central Africa Republic to buy fish in Baga. Wow. So it's not the vat matter is not uh, supposed to be ethnicized mm. because as you will have uh, southern states that will suffer, you will have uh, northern states that will benefit. benefit. Mm. But we don't these days. Our people have lost the capacity to even think deeply about issues. Very well. The first Everything thing is ethnic issue, ethnic issue, yes. ethnic issue, ethnic yes. issue. Yes, I mean, uh, and God has put us together as a people, but managing our diversity is the job of our president and uh, our president and other people who work with it's him. It's the job of the thing. government. And at all levels, at state level, we must Mr. President be conscious must of that. Above any other sentiment is the and the governors too. Governors yes, in the yeah. states yes. too. In the mm. states. Sharing, sharing appointments and everything. Yeah. If there's this perception that mm. this so 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 you are favoring so so person, you must rise. Yeah. See, in fact, during the time of Olu Shegun mm. a lot of southwesterners they they normally curse him yeah, because yeah, they they, get, he's know, not in yeah. any highly digitalized. Mm. No, in terms <laughs> of the the country, in any way. take that away from him. The excuse they usually give is that oh, this ethnic group is small, we are bigger, so we should continue to. But that's that's a big error. Look at uh, Delta State, for instance, no matter what anybody says. If we want to leave it for election alone, mm. Urobo, Isoko, they are almost one. We're mm. producing the governor consistently. Mm -hmm. But Ibori, no matter what you say about him, at least during his time, the governorship, you know, was... Mm -hmm. Shekiri. Wow. Shekiri. The Shekiri would have asked more. Look at Riga. He went to Delta Nuts. Yeah. To, to Delta Nuts. To, to, to Delta Nuts. Yes. Yes. You, know, mm -hmm. you know, look at uh, Rivers. Since 1999, it has been equated. The only exception is Andoni, that's uh, Odili. Mm. Because the equality is almost about in terms of population. And the, oh, our South East, Eastern brothers are also in rivers. Most of them mm. also vote for equity. But you now have to tell what is the future of the Calabari in rivers. And that was what the, uh, Abed, uh, Abed wanted to address it. Yeah, the mm. Ogoni. When he brought you know, uh, so, um, the Akoku people. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's what, what he wanted, like. wanted to solve. So you cannot continuously produce one. Look at uh, Benue State, for instance. We know the TV sign, but you know, they have the highest number of population. But you have uh, Igede, 
you have a doma. Mm -hmm. So since 1999, it has been TV. In Kogi State, if not because of what happened during that election, it mm -hmm. will have been a gala since 1980. Now, mm -hmm. no mm -hmm. way for Alibira man, no way for Okuma. Mm -hmm. It's not supposed to be like that. There should be equity, there should be justice, there should be inclusion. Even if there is a very small ethnic group, give them the opportunity yes. to also have a yes. Don't use uh, the your own small, own own small own ethnic group may mm. in fact produce yeah. your best governor oh, ever. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm. That we shouldn't use even uh, these people, they have the capacity to decide who becomes the next governor, mm. even if you guys, you have the numerical advantage. You know, in Kirby State, Adamo Alero is the most powerful politician. Mm -hmm. All that we expect to happen is for people like Alero, who can determine who becomes the next governor, mm -hmm. to say, okay, given the fact that we've, we've been there for this long, can we not try your hands at this thing? Bukola Saraki, for whatever you may say about him, he did it in Kwara. Mm -hmm. He did it in Kwara. Because it will have remained, that thing will have remained in Elonio. Central. But he just said, okay, let's even go to Kwara South. Yeah. And that was how uh, Abdul Fatai became. You may, have, you may say that he did it to make it difficult for his father to produce the mm. next governor, which was actually what happened. But at the end of the day, yeah. that's what we see. Mm. At least he punctuated that uh, unbroken. Uh, trend from 99. He punctuated it with the coming of uh, uh, Abdul Fatai, the son of the policeman. So, this is what we expect to see in Kebi as well. Mm. All right, we'll take this break. When we come back, we'll discuss more. It's Journalist Hangout on Sunday. We'll be right back. Yes, it's journalist hangout on Sunday. I see how Babajiri Kolade Otitoju in the studio and Adewale Adewe. And we are still looking at the Kebbi State political crisis and talking about the three senatorial districts in Kebbi State, how um, the governorship and other positions should be rotated and not lopsided. So they've been complaining. We have um, this elder forum and we've been trying to reach the... Um, public relations officer of the movement of rotational um, rotation political parties in Kepi State. That's Abdullahi Mohamed Lamba via um, Zoom or a phone call. So we're still expecting to connect with him. So Jide, ultimately, for every other state, for political parties, mm -hmm. this will be a factor to watch out for because it's mm -hmm. going to be a big crisis if no. it's not well managed. What, the what, I major say, parties. what I can say is that we will stay on the KB matter um, because it's very important we stay on the KB matter we want to see how it gets resolved in the final analysis you know we want to see how it gets resolved uh, hopefully we'll be able to talk to our guests that we, 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 for obvious reasons we couldn't talk to him now obviously we'll be able to talk to him um, Next time. Hmm. What are you doing? Managing this. We hope the state will reflect its mm. slogan, which is a uh, land of equity. There can be uh, there can be equity when people are being given the impression that they don't they don't have the right to govern the state, or that the right to govern the state is the exclusive uh, privilege of a particular senatorial district. So, uh, do you what is watching? Mm -hmm. I hope at the end of the day, justice will prevail. Mm. Justice, we just hope that justice will prevail. Then, moving on. Mm. A hungry man, they say, no. is an angry man. Yeah. Hence, a poorly paid judge could be very no. dangerous. Very dangerous. And the Governor College Ibadan GCI is a school with a checkered history and reputation for our education system. In our education system, but most times, reputation are hard to sustain as the school is witnessing decay and infrastructure of infrastructure at the institution prompted by Old Boys Association. 
It prompted the Old Boys Association to ask government to grant them the mandate to rebuild the school and take full control of its operations. Let's share some of the background story about the school with you before discussion. Government College Ibado GCI was founded on the 28th of February 1929 by Selwyn McGregor Greer. The college was modeled after the British public boarding school of that era with just 29 boys as its pioneer students. Over the years, the college has produced many prominent Nigerians who are at the top excellent of their careers, like the Nobel Laureate Professor Wale Shoinka, Ace Broadcaster Dr. Christopher Kolade, Air Commodore Gabriel Esho, Ex-Chief of Air Staff, Professor Jide Oweye, the founder of Leeds City University and Dr. Akinola Aguda, the first Chief Justice of Botswana and several others spread across various fields of human endeavor at home and abroad. The college, like many other old secondary schools in Nigeria, has been under the management of government until recently. Due to the overwhelming infrastructure dilapidation at the institution, the Old Boys Association of GCI are asking government to grant them the mandate of not just rebuilding the school, but also taking full control of its operations. Whether the government will grant their request of rebuilding or taking full control of the school is left to be seen. Until then, Government College Ibadan, which stands as a beacon of academic excellence in Nigeria, needs urgent attention to restore back. Wow. Government College, but you see, I'm sure those people that attended that great school by now <laughs> will be shaking their heads. But I, I, I saw some really disturbing Yes, yes, visuals. yes. And one thing about as a maintenance uh, culture, even if we have, most of these buildings might have been built in the 20s, 30s, mm. they still have them around, not maintained, and students will still be attending that school now under the same atmosphere. Yes, it's, the, the, a building can be very old, mm. but yes. you can restore it. Yes. Restore it and it will, it will still be there, you know, um, resplendent and remaining um, mm. rock solid. Even those old buildings uh, are even stronger. I, there was an hotel that I saw in Mozambique, very old, more than 100 years. But if you look, if you see the building, Maintenance. you won't believe. You know, so it's because they, they constantly restore it is old architecture, but the inside is so beautiful, thanks to the constant uh, restoration that they do. Yes, some of the uh, look at even the Anglican Church CMS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. The it's, cathedral is been standing rock solid mm. for so many years, mm. so many years. You know, so it has to do with the maintenance. If we leave infrastructure to decay, there's no way students, old students, won't um, uh, feel extremely bad. Because for these old students, this school made them whatever they are today. Mm. They feel indebted. Mm. They feel grateful to the school. But to come back and see the school in such a bad state, there's no old student wants to see that. They want to take it over. They now they are saying that, look, it's just, a, it's, just a, it's just a suggestion. Yes. For me, I've never seen where that happened, where um, government hand, handed over a school oh, to gosh. old student to run it completely. Uh, but what is the but essence you of can, it? You can work with the school mm. to freshen up the infrastructure there. I went to my old school. Um, and, and Okene Abdulaziz at Memorial College. And I saw that the old students had even delivered some fresh buildings. Yeah. You know? Just fresh buildings like the sick bay and all that. So, 
all students can continually do that. But for these ones, I think they, are, they just feel extremely um, bad that despite their efforts, things are not improving at the pace that they will want uh, them to improve. And that's why they are thinking that perhaps the they best thing is to yeah, allow them to take it over. I've seen, um, um, I've seen uh, what was it called? Religious uh, bodies take over schools. The missionaries take over schools, you know. But I've not seen old students hmm. completely take over a school. What, what, do you make, what do you make of this uh, proposal? Taking it over outrightly and because they are not happy with the pace of development? Mm, I, I think the best that I think should happen is collaboration between the state government and the old boys. So that the old boys can partner with the state government. The school is uh, 90 years old or more. It's supposed to be a national monument, mm. or at least a regional monument in the Western region. It's supposed to be part of our history. Because, um, I mean, it has produced so, like just what I've said, people like say, Prende Quincy, people like Tim Aluko, mm. the former, you know, above Benin, they so, all attended this so great school, mm. you know, Radio One. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of it's a trail for all of us that. People want to go and look at the place and say, look, this school is over 90 years old and it should be part of our history. So I don't think uh, they should expect the school to be handed over to them 100%, but there should be a kind of collaboration. Mm -hmm. Maybe they are also concerned about government bureaucracy. So they should be given some level of autonomy in terms of the kind of um, investment that they want mm -hmm. to put into the school, what they the are kind saying. of infrastructure they want to build. And also managing the resources. Their own argument is that government has so much on its plate mm. that it mm. should be ready to give up mm. some of. Mm. Uh, looking at the not, area view from this drone shots, mm. you will even know that look, this school, fantastic <laughs> school, yeah. fantastic, mm. school. fantastic school, beautiful, beautiful, you know, fantastic school. Hmm. Uh, a professor of nuclear engineering at the University of Science and Technology, Missouri, in the United States, Ayodeji. Alajo joins us via Zoom. Thank you for joining us. It's an old student. Oh, the lost connection with him. I, my producer is trying to get him again. That um, mm -hmm. a, a professor of nuclear yes. engineering. That is an old student of the school. Of, of mm -hmm. that school. You can see Missouri, in the United States of America. That's Professor Ayodeji Alajo. So we'll, we'll still get him. We'll still get him. So, in essence, Things like this, even the state government should even recognize, like schools like CMS Grammar School, mm -hmm. King's College, oh, Methodist yeah. Boys um, ah. Secondary mm -hmm. School, you know, schools with... You know, um, Grammar School like King's College, if, if they want to raise 10 billion, honestly, yeah. from, their, from their old, old students oh, who, are, my, who are doing my. very well, yeah. they will raise it. They will raise it. Yes, they will raise it. They produce CBN construct. governor, produce all kinds of people. Yes, mm, even you know? if you go to the Obalende, the Obalende uh, school, you still see mm. the old building. Mm. That old building, when they started, the white, always white. But uh, the, the, the old building is, is part of the identity of the school. Mm. No matter how old they are, mm. they won't be demolished, yeah. but you, they must be restored constantly so that mm. They, they, they can uh, continue to and stand the They are even time. stronger. They are stronger in terms of... Yes, them. yes. Ah, in those days, they were, they were using burnt bricks mm. to mm. build some hostels. Mm. And those hostels are still standing. They are still standing. They are still standing. Burnt bricks. Yes, burnt bricks. In some cases, uh, uh, what you call uh, plywood was used to build some... Staff quarters in Amadu, uh, in uh, Adulaziz Atab Memorial College, mm. Okene, and they are still there. Mm. You mm. know, it's it's just unfortunate that a lot of these schools have been left to decay. I remember Sule Lamido telling me that one day he went to Barewa College, mm. Barewa College, know, one of the great wow. schools of our country, and he saw that there were more than one hundred students in the class. He saw that there were no louvers, and some of them were hanging on the window to mm. write. You know, just sitting on the window, no desk, sitting on the window to write. And he, he said, he just burst into tears. That this same school that white people used to come and teach us. Hmm. See what is being reduced to? The roofs, the ro roofs have been blown off. Hmm. So you just find people, students taking instruction in a completely terrible atmosphere. And yet we want the best out of such students. So there is a need 
if I suppose suggested some time ago that these iconic schools, mm. that government should give them special attention so that they don't decay, decay mm. before our eyes mm. to the point that all students come home, uh, come to school, they see what's there and they burst into tears. I mean, mm. it shouldn't be allowed to happen. Mm. Hopefully, um, with GCI, mm. uh, we can set an example. Mm. What's wrong with us when it comes to maintenance? What's Why is this a reflection of um, the state of Nigeria itself? You know, it tells us about the, our history. You know, negligence, uh, we don't care about our past, we don't treasure our history. You know, so it's, uh, it's, it's not just a uh, government uh, college, but most of the uh, union schools, the first generation, second generation, they are in a, in a, in a terrible state of uh, mm. affairs. You know, affairs. Go to Titcom College in Egbe, mm. go to Ekitiparapo College, all of them. You know, and in those days in the 70s, you had people from India who are common teachers. Yes. Master, in the school, master master teacher, we had somebody from England mm. who was a teacher mm. living on the campus. Mm. Most master teachers you know, from Ghana. Mm. You know, people from India will come and beg to be to be teachers in your, in, in, in here in Nigeria. But what do we have we've to lost, do? We've lost that glory. You know, we will see people taking their children to Togo to go and to go attend mm. secondary school. Francophone schools. Mm. I've been in Francophone countries. Mm. Yes, Nigeria is the very ones sad. there. Very sad. All the universities. If we allow the public schools to completely decay then to be terrible because no one even wants to send his children to public schools. Mm. Those who can afford it will put their mm -hmm. children in a, in a private school, okay. but they are still I, useful to us. Okay, I have Professor Ayodhya Jalajo back. Thank you for staying with us. Well, thank you for having me here. All right, Prof, please tell us about the state of infrastructure in Government College, Ibadan. Well, well uh, the, the state of infrastructure in Southern colleges is below what it should be for a school of that stature. It, and this is not something that started today. Like it's in, it's where the uh, infrastructure that is available is not sufficient to handle the number of students that are within the school. So we see, for example, in government college that we have thousands of students where the infrastructure there is not sufficient for it. And beyond that, you have decadence that is the structure that they are no longer able to function as they are. So, all those things um, add, add to the issues that we see in the education at large in my career. What uh, uh, tell us about the, the plan of um, the old students' association uh, that you are? Uh, a member of. Tell about. Tell us about your plan. Please, so I can probably hear you a bit more. What is your plan, as uh, the old student association? What, what, what? How do you intend to solve this problem? Can you please repeat that question again? What? How do you as as? Uh, uh, an old student's body. How do you intend to address this problem of decay infrastructure at your, your school? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. The way we, plan, we are planning to address this is to go exactly how the best schools in the, in the world do this, where the government ownership, or at least not necessarily ownership, but some many ways control of the old boys or other people that are that are capable of running the organization. So let me give an example. If, if I told you the top schools worldwide, you would notice that when the government there's a board of trust that manage and these are people that are technocrats and competent right now we can, the audio is distorted, we can barely hear Professor Ayodeji Alaju, but ultimately we know that the, we reach out to him so that we have an interview with him so that we know what the old students, what they want, is it the Pasha takeover or they want to take it over outright? No, they, Which one? they want to t take over the running of the school and um, I think... Well, the state government allowed them. 
I think that they are drawing from um, examples outside of Nigeria, oh. whereby um, they set up a board of trustees, okay. and the old students will be part of that. What I've not seen where it, it, it happened here. Yeah, it's yeah. Just, it's like they are just throwing that. Mm. Um, uh, mm. Yeah, just putting that debate um, in the public space for people to. Um, for them to see whether the government will be warm to the idea, but mm. uh, fly. what I can suggest to them is that they, they should, work, they should yes, work yeah. with the state. They can double up their efforts. Mm. They can have um, uh, liaison officers amongst the old boys who are residents in Nigeria who will work directly, interface with the government yes. and ensure that whatever funds are released mm. by the, by the old students, that they monitor it honestly. and it's spent judiciously that might be one and of ensure the that things change. Mm. Uh, for now, even government will feel um, uh, insulted mm. if you say they should totally hands off mm. the running of an iconic school like okay. uh, uh, GCI. Well, your last submission on well, this. If we don't face public education, we cannot face leadership in this country because leadership starts, you know, from public schools. If you don't face it, we should forget about having, you know, solution to some of the problems we have in the country. All right. We'll take this break. When we come back, we'll talk about University of Lagos crisis. Stay with us. What is this about? Well, um, we live in a season of sleaze, a season of fake news, and all kinds of reports are flying all over the place. I'm not aware of the visitation panel that the president set up indicting the VC. There is nowhere in the report of that visitation panel that came out in September last year, indicting the VC, nowhere, and I've read it from beginning to the end. In fact, on various issues, including over budgetary spending, including contract uh, overpayments, the panel affirmed that there was no overpayment, that it did not detect any overpayment. It then says, the area termed overpayment relates to fa facility maintenance, which can't be uh, predetermined. Then, it also said that uh, section 3.7 on the issue of um, contract splitting by the VC. The visitation panel found that contract for maintenance and janitorial services are not composite and therefore were rightly separated. You get the point that I'm making? That janitorial services, contract for janitorial services and maintenance were not composite. Therefore, the decision to separate them, the panel found that it was right. That's one. So it then recommended that the bus, uh, the bus tree should always prepare separate vouchers for different services to avoid confusion. So the VC was not indicted on the issue of contract uh, uh, splitting. On the purchase of vehicles, the visitation panel said what appeared to be contract splitting arose because the bus are match payments for different services rendered by the same contractor on a single voucher. That is where when you give someone a chance to defend himself, he comes with his defense. You now see what happened here and what did not happen. So it found that there was no contract splitting in respect of purchase of vehicles because the tenders board approved procurement of vehicles on two different occasions. So you can call that contract splitting as well. Babalaki has been happening on contract splitting, contract splitting. Corruption. Co corruption. But the truth is the report, the report, not, pap not uh, uh, a piece of document not signed that is flying all over the place. 
And because we, we are very easily excitable about uh, anything that has to be called option, we don't even ask the right questions. Let people do their best to get a copy of the visitation panel report. They will see that all of these issues are addressed. Yeah. Different dates. Over budgeting on over budgeting. The panel also found that extra expenditure on the convocation ceremony was duly reported to the council. So if you accuse the VC of spending extra money on the convocation, that had been reported to the council, which means that the man did not uh, do it without the knowledge of the approving authority. authority. Then, he was also accused of spending extra money on the purchase of vehicles in 2017. But the panel found that all of that expenditure on vehicles came before November 2017, which means it was the former VC that purchased those vehicles. You cannot, you cannot uh, hold, hold him Professor accountable Udubu. because Udubu. his own tenure began after November 2017. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things, on, uh, on, uh, the, also on the issue of frequent tra uh, travels, he was also accused of frequently traveling. He was also cleared on that one because every time that the VC traveled, the VC got approval to make those trips. It's a different thing if we are, we are simply out to nail a man. You understand? We will not give him a chance to defend himself. But the visitation panel said that his removal did not follow due process because he was not permitted to defend himself. So the pro chancellor Are didn't really you, give him that chance. Let me ask you, Are you, you so let me ask you separately now. Okay. When these reports came out or when it was reported in Nigerian media. You mean the listed reports? Yes. Okay. Last week when this story broke. It was reported expressly that the vice chancellor of University of Lagos was indicted. What is happening by the visitation panel? Believe me, it's a sad day for the Nigerian media. The entire Nigerian media was raped, misled. That's why I used the word raped, raped, mercilessly disgraced. raped, disgraced, dishonored, dishonored. What has never happened before? One powerful man disgrace the entire journalism in Nigeria. All the newspapers involved, to the extent that even so many programs, what I call fake news, yes, fake, that's news. That's fake news, that all was Nigerian newspapers all carried the newspaper review, bad headlines, fake review. news, fake news, I'm using the word deliberate. Which we talked something about that, today. Something mm. that didn't happen. Let me tell you, when they did it, it wasn't that any newspaper investigated anything. No. They just took a piece of trash. Gave to people and they are reporting it. And how is that journalism? The same the, these people invaded newsrooms and they had their way. And you see it everywhere. Some people even granted it. interviews to yeah. the uh, former chairman. The man behind it, Dr. Babalaki, we know was so glad because people were just insinuating. But a day or two after he was on live on TV, granting interviews based on a fake report, fake news. The rape that he conducted on the Nigerian media. And everybody was laughing that what has come over. Uh, do we have newspapers or do we have rag sheets? See, see, you need to know these issues, apart from the visitation panel, GD, you know, tried to explain very well. Government issued a white paper. And by that, what does it mean? It's gazetted. If you are cleared of anything, that's the end of it. If you are indicted and government accepts the indictment, that's final. But now, un unless you go to court, now, this one was not set up for Unilab. It was set up for all Nigerian public universities, public polytechnics, and public colleges of you know, education, owned by the federal government. This, the visitation panel I mean, you know, submitted their report on August 31st, Nigerian newspaper said the, the, the report sub submitted on September 7th, which is not true. Now, the government that is, that is has not... Shameful. They, yeah. So, in the report, do you know what they did? They just get one or two pages. They now put the 
malicious, you know, mm. uh, Dagari report mm. of Dore yes. Baba. You know, and the, there are four versions Dure, of that same Dagari Dure report. Dore the gnomio Baba lacking time. I put it and you know, I like take and started sharing with the newsrooms. And everybody assumed that it was, it was you know, fresh. Uh, you, know, you know, we like scoops. And everybody feels that. we don't ask questions. No, no. So, what is the thing? And this is what is key to our country. And went on live. And now started demarketing the entire universities in Nigeria. Started, you know, rubbishing what we have. Believe me, it is not a good thing. It should something that should be discouraged. Saying uh, 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 the Nigerian graduate, you shouldn't be taught with even a long you, you know. That, that is not what we need. We have prices. We can we can improve. We can do better. But what we have now is not something we should throw away totally. Because Julie, I still don't understand. I, I sent you this um, story. I sent you the report on Wednesday or Thursday. When I saw it, the headline and everything, it was this thing, and it was reported to Nigeria, and nobody has no. come out to debunk it. I am debunking <laughs> it now. Do you know? Nobody even I'm asked. Debunking them, it nobody even yeah. asked. Nobody even asked. From the university, they are reporting did, that they did the mandate from the federal the ministry. The, nobody said did anybody the, interview anybody. In the nobody ministry? said the report came from the ministry. Nobody said they got the report. It's no not media. signed. No, it's not as, signed. According to professional ethics, you will say you have a company which you cited. Nobody Let us did. show. No, no signed. If someone is going around with that's a document anger. that is not signed, the then you will ask, the you, you, you have a reason. That is not it. I have a copy of the visitation to the report. The, the ministry. I have it. The Ministry of Education. It's not there. It, it was not indicted in a single place. In a single place. And I'm saying it again. In a single. Nowhere. That the VC was indicted. Nowhere. <laughs> Even the, 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 the truth is, we have become so lazy in this profession. And we are damaging the profession gradually. I mean, this is, is this is a, a terrible day. Decided to come together. See, to this is a terrible day in the entire you know, education you know, This is a terrible day before. in journalism. Mm, it is. That editors, so-called gatekeepers, you see a document that is not signed, but you are prepared to generate a story out of an unsigned document? Screaming headlines. That means that. journalists have now become ignorant peddlers, purveyors of fake news. Yes. Some of us senior people who have practiced this profession for like 20 years or more. We are now putting out misleading. The misleading. You know, it's not the first time. It's not the first time. Where people choose not to ask questions. I am trained to ask questions. Nobody, if you brought that kind of document to the news magazine where I was trained, and you, you put it, you publish it, your job is gone. Nobody will see you there the next day. It's not even going to happen. There are enough layers, layers of impregnable gatekeepers to ensure that it is checked. Before you can then put it on something that is not signed. <laughs> do you know? Do you know what the the visitation panels were supposed to do? Mm -hmm. They were supposed to carry out a ten year, you know, uh, uh, like audit, something like that, on the universities. Mm -hmm. the, that is what if you read that if you read what the government told them, 2011 to 2015. That would be one report. They would, each. On each school, they submitted two, two reports. Then 2016 to 2020. Of all the public, I mean federal universities in Nigeria, of all the federal polytechnics, federal colleges of education, somebody suddenly just woke up and started, you know, saying, you know, things, lies from the pit of hell. And that's not enough. Publishing it to all the newspapers. To me, is the news publishing it in publishing it in the gullible newspapers because it's not everyone that no, took it hook line and sinker no you see uh -huh. the, if you see the, the distance from the federal they put all the newspapers date by date the, 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 the is it in this oh. review i was i, I oh. listened to this is shameful our that, 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 that promoted that promoted that a lot of discussions on many channels or many you know yes, that was many programs many you know, TVs, many you know because, because it was shot, perhaps yeah, because, because it was shot. 
It's not indicted. It's nobody no, indicted. That's, that's the misrepresentation mis we're because, talking about. Because we cause a lot of us journalists don't ask the right absolute questions. Lies, false a lot of us journalists we don't we we we, we put our so-called training to shame. We don't ask questions. And then somebody puts something on, we just we believe. We start this, running around how with your source. Can you be questions? proud of this? If you are in this uh, profession, how can you be proud of this? Hmm. What is there See, to be proud of? The panel, the visitation panel found that there was no indication that the VC was invited to defend himself on specific allegations. It also said the action of the post-chancellor is in clear breach of the provisions of the law. That council, the, 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 the visitation panel have found that that council, the governing council of Unilag, has limited knowledge and understanding of the law regulating the institution within which they are expected to operate and give policy directions. So is this how to indict someone? Do these words look like Indictments. somebody who has been indicted? No. no we don't really. ask questions. Someone comes to you, he, he sits in front of you, just churning out lies. You will not ask him the questions that will sit him. You will be asking patronizing questions and we say that's journalism. Did it, let me even ask you, is that possible under the President Buhari? You will be accused of corruption and the same government of Buhari will set up panel against you yeah. and the panel will indict you and will return to office under Buhari. It's not oh, going to happen. Oh. 100%. Nobody can get it. It's not going to happen. They will indict you and then you come back to so, work but, but from I, suspension? Yes. It's not going to happen. I mean, it's like these are questions that people should ask. It's like somebody who has died and later, you know, resurrects. So I think that same man, the same man, that same man, at the time when the inglorious desire to bring the VC down was on, the VC was in a bomb to see the governor trying to find funds. For the Nigerian University Games, because the governor of Akwaibon is an alumnus, hey, it's an alumnus. Yes, yes. he went to him to seek for funds. It's the same time that they were trying to bring him down. For the first time in the history of that school, because we need to talk about positives, there is a microfinance bank that Unilag started that the CBN has given um, uh, approval for, 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 for them to, to, to continue with. The, the microfinance bank of the school is now on. Do you see the latest university rankings? How many Nigerian universities, you know, featured, you know, in global ranking? Uni like UI and uh, I think I think Uni Learning and uh, one state university and one private university. We, whatever we have, we know we can improve on them. Yes. But it does not mean we should just destroy ourselves. Our Where can we get the original news? Uh, the, the original um, position of this visitation panel. The, the the report since we can't get it from the media the, the, no, 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 the federal, no. the federal, there, the federal yeah. ministry of education you know you know said the the release today okay you know this is it okay. they said they are with the company and they are in the process of setting up uh a white panel. paper committees. they will set another panel they will do white paper committees mm. on each of these and do you know how many federal universities you have in nigeria how many mm. federal polytechnics how many federal you know colleges of education so they will do on that and so that, that interpretation was just too hasty that look it's at not it, even let, hasty. Let it does not exist they said they don't attempt, get the point that we are making the attempt it does not exist mm. to the attempt to ridicule the work of the panels you know and uh, mislead the Nigerian public yes. mm. is unfortunate and regrettable. Mm. Also, they probably saw that the report yes, does not favor so them. Yeah. <laughs> it does, the report does not favor them, so they are trying to um, blackmail the visitation panel okay. in the hope that um, the, the, the visitation panel will probably change some of what it had decided on. But okay, I have I have the color. Thank you for joining us. Oh, we lost connection with that caller. So the, the there is no way I'm I'm repeating it on air now. There is no way that the visitation panel indicted the VC. I say it with my full chest. There is no way the visitation panel indicted the VC. For Nigerians who have not seen the uh, that report, well. I'm saying it that there is nowhere that that pan the visitation panel <laughs> indicted the VC. In fact, it 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 affirmed that it was not given fair hearing. 
and that the process of removing him was wrong. It was wrong. There should have been a joint committee of the Senate as well as the council to investigate the allegations before now coming up to say, okay, this is our punishment for the VC. But that didn't happen. Everyone knows that that didn't happen. And that was what we were saying back then. Because you can't build something on nothing. You, 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 you went against the norm to punish a man. You relegated the Senate. And of course, they complained. They, co they complained. And when the Senate that you claimed couldn't sit because uh, there was strike, when it was time to take a decision, did they not all come together? Let me tell you. Chief uh, uh, Babalola is alive. Mm. He was... Uh, 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 pro, I mean, uh, chairman of Can pro and chairman of, of that university. Yes. Mm. His legacies are there. Go to yes. that university. Yes. The illustrious Gamaliel on not today mm. was in that same. Mm. You can see what he did. Mm. Let's professor Moro. Professor Jerry Ghana, mm. that professor of geography, mm. was in the same. You can go to Uniland. You will see it. Why is the first alumnus of the university to assume now, you know, almost ruined the whole place because of what? This is it's ego and that is at work. Each now. time you do it, if it's a if it's a corruption issue, why is it that you, you will take delight in demarketing the university, demarketing that university, demarketing that university? That's no, not the fair. marketing will not work mm -hmm. because people will see that nothing. The VC is just one individual. Mm -hmm. That university is bigger than VC one million times. It's bigger mm -hmm. than anybody. Mm -hmm. So it's not about the VC. I get the point. I get the point that you are yes, making. Yeah. No, just the baby people the should not believe. Mm -hmm. The lying propaganda spreading all over the place that the visitation panel indicted the VC. Absolutely. There is no line, no line in that report as as voluminous as it is where the VC was indicted. Mm. The, okay. the public had been uh, fed a t I mean a diet of lies mm. over this matter, and we are telling Nigerians now that that whole thing is complete falsehood mm. that cannot stand the test of. Of scrutiny. Okay. This is the beauty of journalists hang out on Sunday. We have enough time to trash out the issue and the crisis of the University of Lagos. You agree with me that yes, <laughs> <laughs> I don't even see crisis. There's no crisis. I don't even see crisis. There's no crisis. Look at the, look at the current. We do not apologize that we There's misled no the public. So people being misled. I'm apologizing that we misled the public. Yes, people okay. being misled is not crisis <laughs> in the region. There's no crisis. 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 There's and uh, the VC the are the working council. together. Yeah. Tell you so it's also an alumnus. Yes, senator. Yes, senator. Yes, senator. Senator. That's no crisis. Okay. They are going to have their next uh, convocation in February. Mm -hmm. Remember, convocation was postponed mm -hmm. under mm -hmm. someone's leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, indefinitely. Uh, now they will have another convocation in February. So that's the thing. That's no crisis. Yeah, in you know, right. Do you know we have to leave it there? <laughs> no <crisis. laughs> Nobody should call it crisis. I'll thank you. <laughs> okay, misleading reports from yes. the media. Shameful mis... I'm ashamed <laughs> of the Nigerian press. Okay. Me too. Me too. Me too. I'm angry. I'm angry. Okay. I'm ashamed of it. <laughs> Lazy journalism. <laughs> and that's our offering today. Join us tomorrow for another episode of the program.